We have a non-Muslim. Okay, go ahead, sister. Assalamu alaikum. I'd like to ask if you could shed some light on a verse in the Bible. It's the Old Testament, Solomon chapter 5, verse 16. It's the Hebrew text. Hiko mamitikim wikulo Muhammadim zidude wazara'i baine Jerusalem. I know that in English, Muhammadim has been translated to altogether, altogether lovely. lovely. What I'd like to ask is why do Christians not know that Muhammad has been spoken about in the Bible? For the sisters asked the question, she's given the Hebrew of the verse of the Bible from Song of Solomon, chapter number 5, verse number 16, which says, Hikkum amitakim vikulli muhammadim zaidudi zairai baina Jerusalem. Which means, sister only translated one word, it means he's most sweet, he's altogether lovely, he's my beloved, he's my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. This is the complete translation of the Hebrew verse she quoted. And when it says, Hikkum amitakim vikulli muhammadim, Muhammadim in the Semitic languages, when you give respect, you add him to it. Like Allah is for God, Elohim is respect for God. So same thing to the name Muhammad, وسلم, they add him and it means, it says Muhammadim. So if you read the original text, the name of Muhammad, peace be upon him, is even mentioned in the Bible. Sister is asking, then why don't the Christians believe in Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him? Sister, you should ask this question to the Christians. I ask this question to hundreds of Christians. Alhamdulillah, some of them accepted Islam. Most of them did not. So I agree with you that the name of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is mentioned in the scriptures of most of the major world religions, including Bible. And as I mentioned earlier, that not only is he mentioned by name, He's even prophesied in various different parts of the Bible. He's prophesied in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 18, verse number 18. In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 18, verse number 19. In the book of Isaiah, chapter number 29, verse number 12. In Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 16. He's also prophesied in the New Testament. In the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verse number 16. Gospel of John, chapter number 15, verse 26. Gospel of John, chapter 16, verse number 7. Gospel of John, chapter number 16, verse number 12 to 14. In several places, sister. So that's what I asked to the Christians. If it's clearly mentioned about the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, then why don't they believe in him? Those Christians who really study and analyze and do research, Alhamdulillah, they accept Islam. The others who do not want to accept the truth, and say, oh, I have been a Christian for 40 years. Now you want me to change my religion? So they are afraid. Many a time the ego comes in between. Many a time the society comes in between. Many a time what will my friends tell me? What would my customers tell me? So these things prevent them from accepting the beauty of Islam. What they fail to realize they wouldn't mind offending their creator just to please their family and their friends. Pleasing our creator is more important than pleasing your family and friends. So those who realize the importance of creator, importance of almighty God, Alhamdulillah, they accept Islam. Sister, I would like to ask you that are you a Christian or are you a Muslim? I've been studying Islam for about six months. Mashallah. So do you believe now that there is one God? I do. Do you believe Jesus is God? Peace be upon him? No, I don't. Do you believe Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, the messenger of God? Yes. Mashallah. So if you believe there is one God, you believe Prophet Muhammad, messenger of God, and according to me, you are six months of research. Yes. <laughs> Your six months of research have brought you to the truth, sister. Pardon, I didn't hear you. <laughs> Those are tears of joy. 
Yeah. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> when a person realizes the truth, that's what even Quran says that when people hear the verse of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the moment the believer, tears roll from their eyes. So these are tears of happiness and joy that we have found the truth. As Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said in the Gospel of John, seek ye the truth and the truth shall free you. So I believe the truth has freed you today, sister. Your six months of research has brought you to the truth. Sister, would you like to accept Islam? <laughs> sister, would you like to accept Islam? Yes. Is anyone forcing you? Absolutely not. You're doing a lot of your own free will? Yes. Inshallah, I say it in Arabic and you can repeat it. Okay. <laughs> Ashadu. Ashadu. Allah. Allah. Ilaha. Ilaha. Illallah. Illallah. Wa ashadu. Ashadu. Anna. Anna. Muhammadan. Muhammadan. Abduhu. Abduhu. Wa rasuluhu. Wa rasuluhu. I bear witness. I bear witness that there is no God. That there is no God. But Allah. But Allah. And I bear witness. And I bear witness that that Prophet Muhammad. Prophet Muhammad is the messenger. That is the messenger. And servant of Allah. And the servant of Allah. Servant. servant of Allah. MashaAllah, sister, you are a Muslim. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that as He has guided you, may Allah make you a source to guide the other non Muslims towards Islam. And I pray to Allah to grant you the best in this world and the akhirah and to grant you Jannah paradise, inshallah. I actually got an email many months ago, last year. Uh, and I unfortunately don't have time to answer to all of my email, but sometimes Allah just blesses and I'm able to. An email came uh, to my public account and uh, it was a lady from uh, Israel and she literally starts off that I was born into a Jewish family. Uh, I'm from uh, a Western country. I cannot give too many details, by the way, we'll understand why. And uh, I migrated to Israel for religious reasons. It's called the Aliyah, uh, Hijrah. I made Hijrah to Israel. As a young girl, I abandoned the West. The, she is in the, uh, this part of the world. I abandoned and I moved there. And over the last few years, I grew agnostic. Now I'm looking for the truth. And I've read the Quran and I'm, you know, and I came across your lectures online. And uh, I'm interested, etc., etc. So obviously, it's a very interesting. Of course, it's a bit strange as well. I mean, uh, very rare to find that type of person. So we began a series of emails and whatnot. Then I said, you know what? It was, I then emailed her in like late November. So, you know, I'm coming in January. Why don't we meet up in Aqsa? We meet up. She had never been to Aqsa because she's not allowed to go because she's uh, obviously from another background. She had never been to Masjid al-Aqsa. So uh, we agreed to meet up and subhanAllah, to make a long story short, uh, she was not exposed to Islam via da'wah tables, via pamphlets. That doesn't happen in that <laughs> land. It does not happen. Rather, she felt a sense of emptiness and she did not find that peace in her own faith of her tradition. She didn't find it in Christianity. She looked at Buddhism, other uh, religions, and in the end, out of desperation, she picked up a Quran. She didn't think she'd find anything in it. And she said, this is the book I have been taught is full of hatred. This is what she told me. My whole life I have been taught this book teaches to kill other people, hatred of other people. Hmm. And she goes, I read it and read it and read it and I found nothing but peace. I wow. found nothing but peace. And so she went online looking for lectures. She found my lectures, listened to some of them. And subhanAllah, my lecture about Khadija was the one that really moved her a lot about Khadija salam. She said, I want it to be like Khadija. I want it to be like wow. Khadija. And subhanAllah, brothers and sisters, she gave her shahada in Masjid al-Aqsa with our group and gathering there. I gave her the shahada. She said the kalima and she accepted Islam in Masjid al-Aqsa. That is and amazing. we were not able to record because she said she cannot be public about this. She cannot tell other people or else it's going to cause issues for her and her family. That obviously oh. she has to keep hmm. it the, 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 you know, keep for it. For now, but hopefully and I gave her she can get, go public. Uh, so we call her now Aisha and our sisters that were in the group are in touch with her. And subhanAllah, she's now active online da'wah, believe it or not, but anonymously. She's giving da'wah anonymously online. Have you ever thought, brothers and sisters, that the Prophet ﷺ so much wanted Abu Talib's hidayah? 
And yet Abu Talib was not blessed with Hidayah. And here we are blessed with that, that we never had that strong desire before our existence. It wasn't something we willed. Have you ever wondered Ibrahim alayhi salam, how much he made dua to Allah for his father's hidayah? How much he begged Allah? Ibrahim alayhi salam, so much so until Allah tells him, this one thing, don't do it. Your father is gone now. You cannot make dua for him. You cannot pray for him now. But he kept on praying, praying, praying because he wanted hidayah for his father. And here we are. And Allah Azza wa Jal chose that hidayah for us. He gifted us that hidayah. So the least that we can do, brothers and sisters, is to thank Allah and appreciate that blessing upon us. One of the reasons we love when people convert, one of the reasons it's so exciting, we all become happy, is because it reaffirms our own faith in our tradition. It makes mm. us feel, alhamdulillah, that something we might not have appreciated, but this person has appreciated. And we feel, and we should rightfully feel, we feel a sense of pride that alhamdulillah, somebody has found what we have taken for granted. And there's no problem in, 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 in being that happy and whatnot, but you should be happier at your own Islam, by the way, right? You should be even <laughs> happier that Allah has guided you to Islam. And there's, it's mm. good to reaffirm our faith through uh, the stories of converts. And that's why our convert brothers and sisters, they know every time they're in a Muslim gathering, the first question after they find out they're Muslim, oh, how did you convert? That conversion story, it is really powerful for, for us born Muslims. We love to hear it because it reaffirms our faith. It makes us feel so good. It makes us feel a sense of pride. Assalamu alaikum. Alaykum My name sir. is Aaron. I grew up in New York City. We are Jews. My forefathers came up from the area of Eastern Europe, from what is today Poland. They left their home when the increasingly anti Semitic Russian Empire controlled parts of Poland after 1795. After a long journey, they arrived and settled in New York. Cool. My family were never Orthodox Jews. Nevertheless, Judaism did play an important role in our life and was an important marker of our very identity. We followed the traditional rituals and celebrations while engaging with society around us. Hmm. From an early age, I developed a passion for music. By the time I was a teenager, I was all into experimental music, and I cool. was especially fascinated with the traditional music and musical instruments from other parts of the world. I would use the different sounds and include them in my own compositions. One day, okay. a friend told me about Indonesia and that I can study ethnomusicology there. Nice. I was determined to travel to Indonesia and enroll in the Art Institute that offered the degree in Ethnomusicology. When I arrived in Indonesia and enrolled in the Institute, I did not tell anyone that I was Jewish. In Indonesia, you usually have to state your religion. I just stated that I was Buddhist. That was the easiest choice at this time. I was worried that people will show hostility towards me because I was Jewish, and since I did not practice my former religion to a great extent, I did not mind to claim that I was Buddhist. And honestly, during the time in the early 2000s, it was kind of hip to claim that one was Buddhist. Indonesians viewed us new Western Buddhists as exotic and did hmm. not ask any uncomfortable questions. I stayed for more than two years in Indonesia. During that time, I joined many music projects, and I tried to stay out of religious discussions as best as possible. I concentrated on my music, and even my own Jewish religious traditions became very distant. I was away from my family, away from my Jewish community that usually endorsed joining our traditional celebrations. Mm -hmm. Islam seemed like this local religion that was just not for me, and I thought that practicing Muslims just spend too much of their time praying than doing really important things. Then, one day, I joined a traditional gamelan performance. Gamelan is a traditional percussion instrument in Java, made from metal. Next to me sat an old man who started talking to me. It was in the middle of my second year. 
mm. and my Indonesian had become quite good. He explained to me the connection between the gamelan and Islam. He told me about an ancient royal gamelan ensemble, which has the only purpose of commemorating the birth of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. The gamelan sakaran is bigger than all the other gamelans and is only used once a year. The old man continued that the playing of this gamelan is supposed to represent continuous praises for the Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. This story impressed me because I have never thought about the spiritual aspects of music. His explanations made a lasting impact on me. I continued composing experimental music, and my gamelan recordings became an important part of it. I started reading more about the spiritual aspect of Islam, and especially the so-called Islamic mysticism in Indonesia. Mm -hmm. And honestly, it touched me. It influenced me. I understood that Islam was a lived religion, and that it was full with spirituality that I wanted in my life. I had seen Islam as a dry and strict religion that only focuses on the outer aspects and roles. Mm. Reading about Islam in Indonesia, I learned that my perception was far from reality, and the more I read, the more interested I became. I also read about Islam in other places of the world, and I was fascinated about its richness. I was interested to embrace Islam and become Muslim, but I worried about my family. What would they say? A Jew becoming Muslim? And that is the I didn't question. want to lose them. Eventually, I followed my heart. I spoke my Shahada in a small Muslim community center in New York City. I started praying and I joined the regular Dhikr circle. The rhythmic remembrance of Allah is wonderful. It is like spiritual music that soothes the heart and calms the mind. True. I did not tell my family that I converted to Islam for a long time. Since I did not live with them anymore, it was quite easy to keep it hidden. But mm -hmm. eventually, they were suspicious of me. I tried to get around the religious celebrations and our regular Jewish community gatherings. When I told them, they were just quiet for what seemed like forever. Then my mother asked me if I was happy, and I said, yes. But my father made a request. Can you please wait to make it all public? I mean, nowadays people have bad opinions about Muslims, and I don't want our friends to think negative about you or us. I complied with my father's request. And I still do. We just don't talk about religion. I only very occasionally join the Jewish community gatherings. Otherwise, I keep low profile. It's been working well for all of us. Mm. I can still see and visit my family. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah.